Monarchy, it should have been the ideal union of two noble families. The Spencers were perfect royal in-laws. They were blue bloods, British aristocracy. On paper, they couldn't have been better. When they became engaged, the Queen said, oh, she's one of us. But these two blue-blooded families were on a collision course. The Spencers and the Windsors, it's been, at times, the clash of the titans. This film will shed new light on the colourful, controversial Spencer family. Diana's stepmother, Rain, was an absolute force of nature. Two families both very similar and very different. The Windsors wouldn't express their emotions, whereas the Spencers expressed it in volumes, catastrophically sometimes. Featuring insider accounts and recently unearthed footage. I've never seen her show her dissatisfaction on camera before. It's a most remarkable piece of footage. We go behind the scenes of the ultimate family fallout. Emotions were running very high. It was unconventional. It was rebellious. It was all the words that you come to associate with the Spencers. The rift between the Spencers and the Windsors had become a gulf. And reveal how the Spencer family changed the House of Windsor forever. Without the Spencers, the Windsors wouldn't be the family that they are today. When Charles Spencer went to the pulpit, we expected it to be emotional, but his eulogy was explosive. I stand before you today, the representative of a family in grief, in a country in mourning, before a world in shock. In front of the royal family and a global television audience of billions, Diana's younger brother launched into a devastating attack on the House of Windsor. I thought, oh my goodness, he's actually damning the royal family. I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you were steering these two exceptional young men. It was critical of the monarch to her face, critical of the royal family to their faces. So that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. Earl Spencer's eulogy was an extraordinary act of rebellion. For centuries, there had been a strong alliance between the Spencers and the Windsors. Charles Spencer, making this eulogy, was looking across the coffin of his sister towards the Queen, and the Queen is his godmother. That's how closely bound the Windsors and the Spencers are. Earl Spencer's emotional eulogy laid bare the differences between the Spencers and the Royals. Differences that had existed from the moment the families first met. Back in 1980, the press were desperate to find out anything they could about a young English aristocrat called Lady Diana Spencer. From the moment she was pegged as a girlfriend of Prince Charles, Diana's life had been turned completely upside down. She'd gone from being just a regular girl about town, albeit a very upper class one, to suddenly the center of media attention. It was absolutely overwhelming. While the world might have only just learned her name, the royal family knew the Spencers well, very well. And as a Spencer, Diana would make more than a suitable spouse for the heir to the throne. Diana came from a truly aristocratic family. The Spencers go back uh, centuries, you know, and had been uh, part of the, the nobility of this country for a very long time. The Spencers of Althorpe came to prominence in the 15th century, when their enormous fortune brought them an earldom from Charles I. For the next 300 years, the Spencers were regulars at the royal palaces. You can look to almost every generation and you'll see that there's a connection between the Spencers and the Windsors. Both of Diana's grandmothers served the Queen Mother in one way or another. 
In many ways, Diana was more royal than the royals. She could trace her ancestry back to the first Tudor king, Henry VII. She could trace her ancestry back to James I. Her blue blood was absolutely impeccable. Diana was proud of her heritage. She always used to refer to the House of Windsor as the Germans because her family, the Spencers, had been in Britain for many, many years before the Windsors moved from Germany. So there was that kind of generational snobbishness that her family was, if not as grand, grander than the uh, royal family. Centuries later, the Spencers and the royal family remained close. So close, in fact, that Diana wasn't even the first of her sisters to date the prince. In 1977, the prince was dating her elder sister, Lady Sarah, and had been invited by Sarah and her father to join a shoot on the Althorpe estate. Sarah had the, the Spencer red hair. She had the most fiery temperament. She knew exactly what she wanted. She certainly gave Prince Charles a bit of a runaround. But Sarah had soon blown her chances when she gave a candid interview to the press. What goes on within palace walls stays within palace walls. And to break that rule so openly was, was a fatal mistake by Sarah. While Sarah and Charles's budding romance was over, the relationship between the Windsors and the Spencers ran much deeper. Diana's father, Johnny Spencer, had been an equerry in Australia when the Queen made a very long tour early in her reign. Johnny Spencer was about as dim as an aristocrat can possibly be. Uh, his commanding officer in the army had said that if you set his trousers on fire, it would take him 10 minutes to realize that his bottom was burning. But that was not a big disadvantage because he knew how to behave, he was extremely polite, his manners were impeccable, and he revered the royal family. But the Queen's relationship with Johnny Spencer was more than professional. There was a strong bond of affection between Johnny Spencer and Queen Elizabeth. When he was serving in World War II, you know, they corresponded too. So he would be a number of, uh, of eligible young men that may have even been considered to be a future um, husband to the Queen. When he married Frances Fermoy, the Queen, the Queen Mother, came to their wedding. And the Queen donated uh, St James's Palace so that he could have a wonderful reception. As the two families grew, they remained close. For the majority of Diana's childhood, the Spencers were the Queen's nearest neighbours. Diana had lived at Park House, which is next door to Sandringham, so she was part of that world. Diana used to go and play at what they called the big house with Prince Andrew, who was almost the same age as her. And one of the nannies actually remembers seeing the Queen on our hands and knees playing hide-and-seek with uh, with Diana and uh, Prince Andrew. The Queen Mother and Lady Fermoy, Diana's maternal grandmother, plotted to see if they could get uh, Charles to marry Diana. The Spencers were perfect to become royal in-laws. They knew royal protocol, they were friends of the royal family, they were British aristocracy. On paper, they couldn't have been better. But while the Spencers had all the right credentials to make this the perfect match, their characters were the polar opposite of the Windsors. The Windsors kept everything to themselves. They wouldn't express their emotions, whereas the Spencers expressed it in volumes, catastrophically sometimes. They argued and fought and were quite dysfunctional. Diana's parents, Johnny and Francis's marriage, was particularly volatile. Johnny Spencer was always seen as a gentle sort of figure. That was his public image. But behind closed doors, he did have a temper on him. And Francis, too, was very forthright. And the two clashed. This very early on damaged Diana as it would any child. No child wants to see their parents screaming at each other. By the time Diana was six years old, her parents' marriage was over. The divorce was one of bitterness and acrimony. The family was split. 
uh, Diana's grandmother testified against her own daughter in favor of Earl Spencer. He won custody of the children, which was very unusual in those days. Uh, and Diana was deeply affected by it, to the point where she almost stopped speaking. And it's something which stayed with her all her life. Then in 1976, Althorpe House gained a new, suitably extrovert resident, Diana's stepmother, Rain. Rain was an absolute force of nature. Um, she was a remarkable creature in many ways, famous for this sort of coiffed helmet of hair. She was a massive social climber. Her mother was uh, a very colorful character. She was the, uh, the Mills and Boone writer, Barbara Cartland, who really turned Rain into a sort of a, a project, really. Rain, she was determined, was to marry well. She set out not just to marry Johnny Spencer, but to marry a house. She really wanted to be Chatelaine of Althorpe. The latest member of the Spencer family did not receive a warm welcome from Diana and her siblings. They used to hum the old nursery rhyme, rain, rain, go away, come back another day, very much in her hearing. Acid rain was, was a, a later variant of uh, rain, rain, go away. I um, mean, acid rain was, was very apt for, for rain in many ways because she had a very sharp tongue on her. There were a lot of clashes between rain and Johnny's children. Diana had a fantasy of how she would escape the unhappiness of Spencer family life, inspired by her new step-grandmother, Barbara Cartland. Diana, as a child, often had her head buried in these uh, very romantic stories of the girl who's whisked off her feet by the handsome prince. Now, aged 19, Diana's fairy tale ending was within reach. The loud and emotional Spencers and the discreet Windsors would soon be brought together for good. By February 1981, after just 13 dates, Prince Charles was ready to pop the question to the eminently suitable Lady Diana Spencer. Charles invited her down to Windsor Castle and they were in the nursery. And he just asked her, you know, would you like to marry me? And she said, oh yes, please. It was just the ultimate dream for her. <laughs> The beginning of a day to remember for Prince Charles, Lady Diana, and for quite a lot of other people too. The long-awaited, much written about engagement had happened. Diana had aristocratic blood, so when they became engaged, the Queen said, oh, she's one of us. The Spencers were respected aristocrats, but this royal union would propel the family to global fame. Johnny was taking one picture after another, it was um, very sweet. Very happy yeah. for Diana. Very happy. Diana's yeah, looks beautiful. She looks beautiful. Diana's lovely. Very, very happy. Never seen her look better. I think that a lot of people were suggesting that he was, he enjoyed a drink or two. But of course, he'd had a stroke in 1978, which had impacted upon the way he spoke. It was the ultimate recognition of the aristocracy and the um, amazing family the Spencers were that uh, the heir to the throne would want to marry his daughter. For Diana's stepmother, Rain, this was the moment in the spotlight that she had been waiting for. Rain wanted to make herself known and so wore a white mink coat so the cameras could focus on her straight away. She was now irretrievably linked to the royal family. She certainly had arrived. People wanted to hear not just from the queen and the royal family, but from the Spencers. Lady Spencer, what, what, are, what are they going to do now? What are their plans now? Where are they going to, when are they going to get married? And where will they go and, and have their honeymoon? And where will they live? Well, I think so much has got to be decided. You know, yeah. there's so many imponderables. Mm. The, the weddings, I think, have been announced will be in July, but no date has yet been fixed. For the obvious reasons, there's so many people's engagement books uh, to uh, re rearrange. Yeah. <laughs> While Diana's father was over the moon his daughter would be a royal bride, her mother Frances was wary. 
What effect do you think it will have on her now that she's going to become a member of the royal family? Do you think it will be easy? It's a very hard question to answer, isn't it? Because it's, very, it's an unknown world for, for her. Looking at a mother talking about the prospect of her daughter marrying Prince Charles, you would expect joy, positive energy. What we see here is something almost quite the opposite. Twelve years on from her acrimonious divorce from Diana's father, it felt like history was repeating itself. Frances, Diana's mother, uh, was terrified that her daughter was going to make the same mistake that she had made. She, Frances, had married very young. She was only 18 when she married Johnny Spencer. There was a big age gap, about 12 years. Isn't that familiar? The same as that between Charles and Diana. Diana's mother's concern was about to be proved well-founded. Following the official announcement of their engagement, Charles and Diana spoke to the press together for the first time. It would become one of the most prophetic interviews in history. I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. From Diana's point of view, it's very straightforward. We're going to get married. Why are you asking me if we're in love? Of course we are. But then Charles gave his answer. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> he was baffled as to how to answer a question that was about his emotions. Don't forget he'd been brought up by the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh to hide what they felt. Normally, the clip cuts when he says whatever in love means. But in this recently unearthed extended clip, you can see the full force of Diana's reaction. <laughs> whatever in love means. <laughs> Well, it obviously, your means, own interpretation. obviously means two very happy people. Yes, Once again, well, from us, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Okay. God, it's incredible looking at that now. I haven't seen that before. The expression on her face is so eloquent. I've never seen her show so clearly her dissatisfaction with him on camera before. It's, it's a most remarkable piece of footage. The silence between the two of them hangs terribly heavily. Diana really, she couldn't be a Spencer and show what she felt. She had to be a Windsor and keep it all under wraps. You can actually see the light go out behind her eyes. She felt almost her world collapse. Now the Prince of Wales' fiancé, the royal family felt Diana needed their protection from the press. And so for her last few months as Lady Spencer, Diana stayed at Buckingham Palace. It was the perfect opportunity for the Spencer, who was soon to be a Windsor, to get to know her future in-laws. Diana has talked about being traumatised by her own parents' divorce, she saw getting married and belonging to the Windsor family as an opportunity for her to create a stable, loving, secure family for herself. Moving into Buckingham Palace would have been quite a shock to the system. Prince Andrew was away in the Navy. Prince Edward was away at school. The Queen and Prince Philip, of course, were in residence, but royals don't just drop in on each other. Diana complained about her life at Buckingham Palace as being very lonely. Uh, she felt isolated. Diana had serious cold feet. She said to her sisters that she was going to call the wedding off. And the sisters said, too late, Dutch, which is their nickname for Diana. Your face is on the tea towels now, so you can't chicken out. While the world got ready for the wedding of the century, the fractured Spencer family became a national talking point. One of the issues was over whether uh, Barbara Cartland, she was the mother of Diana's stepmother, would receive an invitation. Barbara Cartland, the romantic novelist who looked like a huge pot of candy floss, uh, was an embarrassment. 
there was lots of toing and froing about whether she would be invited to the wedding, which of course she probably should have been, but she wasn't. Instead, Diana's step grandmother watched the wedding from home, along with 750 million others around the world. It really is a lovely Cinderella story, isn't it? You know, it's exactly a Barbara Carlton story. It couldn't be better. <laughs> I can say a word. May I say a word? Yes. Um, the Spencers have, through the centuries, fought for their king and country. Today, Diana is vowing to help her country for the rest of her life. She will be following in the tradition of her ancestors, and she will have at her side the man she loves. He was identifying the Spencers and the royals and saying that to bring them together, to unify them, um, was an act of um, patriotism. Are you at all apprehensive about today? Not in the least. I'm looking forward to every moment of it. Johnny Spencer could barely contain himself on Diana's wedding day. <laughs> As Diana said to me, he was waving himself stupid. He loved it. There were two reasons why everyone was looking forward to the moment Diana emerged from that carriage. One, of course, was to see Diana in the wedding dress, and the other was to see how Johnny Spencer, her father, would cope with that walk up the aisle. Earl Spencer's stroke greatly affected his mobility. Now, the steps at St Paul's Cathedral are precarious on a normal day. Once they'd navigated the stairs, then it was about a three and a half minute walk down the aisle. It was a superhuman effort uh, by Lord Spencer, and you can see the concentration on his face. He said that Diana walked him down the aisle, and it was incredibly moving. <laughs> they get to the altar where Prince Charles is, and Johnny Spencer kind of sort of stays there. <laughs> I imagine for the poor television cameras, it must have been a nightmare. Here was the, one of the prime shots, and Lord Spencer was sort of blocking it. Just over an hour later, Diana Spencer became a member of the royal family. Prince and Princess of Wales. The Spencers and the Windsors, two families so close throughout British history, were at last officially tied. What a moment for any parents. The happy couple headed off on honeymoon. They spent a very great deal of their honeymoon at Balmoral. Six weeks with your in-laws. I'm afraid it wasn't the best start to married life. It wasn't long before the differences between the Spencers and Windsors began to reveal themselves. Diana showed how unhappy she was. The Queen really had no time for what she regarded as a sort of self-indulgent, emotional stuff that Diana was pulling on the royals. And she said that Diana would have to buck up. Then on the 21st of June, 1982, the Spencer and Windsor families were irreversibly joined together forever. By royal proclamation, the birth of Prince William was announced. For the Spencers, their blood is in the future King of England, so their place in history is, ass is assured. Diana's mother Frances and her sister Jane rushed to the hospital, where they were the first of the extended family to see the new royal baby. Minutes later, the other happy grandmother arrived, the Queen. The Queen was delighted, as the whole family were, um, allegedly, she said, well, at least he hasn't got ears like his father. And then the final verdict from the Earl Spencer. Good morning, sir. Can you tell us how you're... Good morning. Was? How is she? Very well indeed, thank you. Looks Johnny good. Spencer was absolutely exuberant. Lovely baby, really super baby, you know? Not a little 
Pack it up first. Oh, we're really good. Hello, how are you? <laughs> he was, of course, now grandfather to a future king, and an aristocrat would understand exactly what that meant. It's good news. There was even better news in store for Diana's stepmother, Rain. The queen was coming to Althorpe for tea. Rain was a real perfectionist, and she wanted to make sure everything was done right. There was a full-blown dress rehearsal uh, a day before. She had the whole outside of the house repainted. The visit was in November and, and not best for, for painting and decorating and, and, and the poor old painters, they had to use a sponge to sort of dry all the stonework before they could slot the paint on. It all turned out to be a complete waste of time because the Queen ar ar arrived after dark. To Rain's relief, the meeting between the monarch and the Spencers at Althor ran smoothly. It was a, a triumph for Rain because here she was hosting the Queen pouring the tea. The Spencers and the Windsor's relationship seemed to be going from strength to strength. But it wouldn't be long before they were caught in the middle of the most bitter family breakdown in royal history. The House of Windsor and House of Spencer were forever linked in 1982 with the birth of Prince William. When Prince Harry came along on the 15th of September 1984, the Spencer family blood was suddenly coursing through the veins of the second and third in line to the British throne. Like any father, Prince Charles was keen to introduce his two sons to each other at the first opportunity. And so it was that Prince William was led by the hand back to the room where he was born two years ago. Unlike his brother, Harry seemed to have inherited those striking Spencer looks something Prince Charles clocked straight away. He's alleged to have said, my goodness, you know, he's got red hair. And that was clearly a remark aimed at the Spencer family. Their distinctive hair was already visible. At the entrance to Kensington Palace, the prince and princess and their baby arrived from the hospital at speed and swept in without stopping. Then, less than an hour later, Prince Charles left to play polo, something most new fathers would hardly dare to suggest. The news that he had more or less dumped Diana and Harry at Kensington Palace and hurried out to play polo seemed astonishing, but that was the, often the royal way. This couldn't be further from the family life young Diana Spencer dreamed of when marrying her prince and joining the House of Windsor. I think that Diana had completely different views of what being a Windsor wife was to her husband. To Charles, it was all about duty. It was about producing the heir and the spare, which she had done. I think she felt that perhaps her life was, was very much uh, as of secondary importance at this stage. From Diana's point of view, I think what she wanted was warmth and emotional connection and security, all the things that fell apart for her when she was growing up. On December the 21st, 1984, the Spencer and Windsor families came together to celebrate Prince Harry's christening. In true Windsor style, any problems Charles and Diana were having were pushed to the side. It was all smiles for Harry's big day. Look, I was christened in this. Mm. Looks remarkably well, despite it. Mm. But away from the cameras, there was a clash between the two sides of the family. Charles made a comment to Diana's mother and said, oh, it's a shame Harry's not a girl. Frances took this like a knife to her heart because she lost a baby boy. She was furious that someone could not be totally grateful for a baby who was healthy and, and vigorous. So when she retorted, you should be very happy, you've had a, a healthy boy, he was taken aback because Prince of Wales is not used to being uh, spoken to like that. 
It was an extraordinary outburst because most people are in fear and trepidation of very senior royals and don't want to get into an argument in company. Confrontations like this were not the norm for the reserved Windsors. As Diana struggled to find her feet as a Windsor wife, the royal family hoped she could maintain a stiff upper lip. But as a Spencer, that did not come naturally. Diana was very troubled at this stage of her marriage. She was deeply suspicious about Camilla Parker Bowles. She believed that Charles still loved Camilla, was probably seeing Camilla. And this forced her even further into her eating disorders, I think. Diana would scream and shout and get hysterical and cry. And Charles absolutely had no idea how to deal with a person like that. The Windsors found Diana's fiery Spencer temperament completely alien too. I mean, the Queen Mother allegedly once said that Spencers, the Spencers are very difficult. Um, and Diana was proving that she was indeed uh, quite troublesome to the royal family. The young woman they remembered from the courting days who had charmed the royal family was a dim, dim and distant memory. The royal family don't do sick. And if, if you're cold, you put on a sweater. If you're sick, you take an aspirin. And Diana's moods, uh, staying in her room, not coming out down for breakfast, running out of the room during dinner, th these were baffling aspects of behavior as far as the Queen was concerned. It wasn't long before the Queen had a Spencer knocking on her door for marriage advice. I think Diana would have felt it was quite normal to go to your mother-in-law and say, look, things aren't working out. Oh, you know, what should I do with your boy, with Charles? How shall I, how shall I treat him? Um, and the Queen just replied, I don't know. And as Diana then said, what sort of help was that? The Queen was a bit of an imperial ostrich who didn't want to be burdened with Diana's emotional baggage. I wonder whether she would have felt trapped inside you know, the palace walls. Here I am on my own. Um, I don't feel that there's anyone I can particularly turn to. The Spencers were aware of the problems between the prince and princess, but their close ties with the Windsors made things complicated when it came to helping Diana. Diana's sister, Lady Jane Fellows, was very close to the Windsors indeed. Her husband was on the royal payroll. Jane was therefore in a very difficult position. She was Diana's sister, but she was also married to Robert Fellows, who was the Queen's private secretary or deputy private secretary. There was um, one moment when Diana and Charles had had a disagreement and Diana, again, desperate to get her husband's attention, she got hold of his pen knife and scratched herself. And the next day, she showed her sister, Jane, and said, you know, it was so awful, we had such a fight, and this is what I did. And Jane's reaction, far from being sympathetic to Diana, says, you know, you can't let the side down. You've got to show a stiff upper lip. What Jane means is that you can't let the side down, meaning the royal family, uh, the institution, her own family. The Spencers were desperate for the marriage to work and powerless to intervene when it came to matters within the royal household. There wasn't a huge amount that the Spencer family could do for Diana, I mean, except for being there and offering her support. I mean, she was incredibly close to her older sister, Sarah. With Sarah, I think she could pour her heart out and hopefully get some kind of um, support, advice, guidance, or just a, an arm around her shoulder. Diana's father felt rather helpless when it came to trying to offer solutions to Diana. What could anyone do? She was married to the future king. Beyond the loving words and the loving hug of a, a father, there wasn't much he could do. Among the Windsor children, there was one person who never seemed to warm to the idea of a Spencer joining the firm. Princess Anne. Tricky would be the best word to sum up the relationship between Anne and her sister-in-law, Diana. Tell us any word about Diana. Any word about Diana? I don't know, you tell me. Anne, she didn't like the way she went about her engagements, all that touching and holding hands. 
That was an anathema to Princess Anne, who was very formal and slightly haughty in the way that she went about her official business. And Diana basically just distanced herself from Anne because um, she found Anne very brusque. And Anne couldn't be bothered to deal with Diana's histrionics. So thought, well, if Diana's you know, getting all upset about this, it's too bad. The Queen Mother's traditional Windsor values never wavered either. Charles's greatest support in life was the Queen Mother, his, his devoted granny. And I think the Queen Mother, she probably saw Diana as another Mrs. Simpson, somebody who might conceivably pull the monarchy down. I remember Diana told me that uh, she found the Queen Mother intimidating um, and that she was, you know, rather wary of her. The Queen Mother probably would have felt that Diana should just uh, put up with it, get on with it. That would be her attitude. The Queen Mother counted Diana's grandmother as a close friend and confidant. She was also a useful Windsor ally in the Spencer camp. Lady Ruth Fermoy, Diana's maternal grandmother, had served as a, a lady-in-waiting for the Queen Mother, and she was very much of the same era in terms of her thinking. Divorce was not an option. She knows that Diana is unhappy in the marriage with Charles and desperately unhappy, but effectively tells her to get a grip, suck it up, and stop crying. She sides with the Windsors over her own granddaughter. But there was one Windsor who didn't tow the family line. Royal rebel, Princess Margaret. Diana and Margaret were great pals. First of all, they both lived at Kensington Palace, so they were neighbours. But I think Margaret, perhaps more than any other member of the family, really understood what Diana was going through. She had been the tragic figure uh, in years gone by that perhaps Diana was becoming. She'd had her heart broken by not being allowed to marry uh, a man she'd fallen in love with, um, Captain Peter Townsend, uh, because he was married and then divorced. Princess Margaret understood what it was like to be confined and constrained by the rules and protocol of belonging to the House of Windsor. Both families encouraged Charles and Diana to keep up appearances throughout the 80s. The Spencers and the Windsors were, were united in trying to keep the, uh, the Wales's marriage together. There was very much a sense on all sides that, that the marriage of the heir to the throne could not fail. But eventually the cracks started to show. All the press attention was focused on the couple's attitude to each other as the gloomy winter evening closed in. Rumours of marriage problems put their relationship under intense public scrutiny. I think it must have been horrific for Diana, actually, to continue this, this public persona when her inside she was falling apart and her marriage was crumbling. But worse was to come. In the early 90s, the marriage that joined the two families would reach new lows, with scandals shaking the foundations of both the Spencers and Windsors. As the world's most high-profile royal couple fell apart, their families tried to support them. Diana's Spencer siblings rallied round. Diana especially was close to Charles, so she was thrilled when he was getting married for the first time and uh, agreed that Prince Harry should be a page boy. Now, at Charles Spencer's wedding, Harry looked to be having an absolute ball, but he was, Harry was always impish, he was always cheeky. Diana always said that Prince Harry's the naughty one like me, and she called him my little Spencer. Diana was very proud of her, her Spencer heritage. She wanted her children to be familiar with the Spencer side of the family, so it wasn't just going to be all about the royals. 1992 was set to be a difficult year for the Windsors, with three royal marriages in trouble. An unhappy Diana turned to her own family more and more, but the Spencers also had a terrible year. I mean, 1992 really um, w was bookended by, by sadness and tragedy. The death of, of Diana's beloved father in March that year, uh, that was a a huge blow for Diana, and in many ways, it may have precipitated the things that were to come down the line. Diana was 
really hit for six. And it also coincided with the kind of epoch of the War of the, of the Wales is. She got little support from Charles. Her wreath said, I miss you dreadfully, darling daddy, but will love you forever, Diana. I think she relies on, on Sarah, Jane and Charles, her, her three siblings, as, as you would at a parent's funeral. Then, just three months later, the release of Andrew Morton's now infamous book rocked the royal family. For a year and a half, Diana and I worked together on her biography, Diana, Her True Story. And when it was published in June 1992, people were saying, well, was Diana behind it or what's, what's going on here? But it wasn't just Diana who worked on the book with Morton. Other members of the Spencer family were also involved. Charles Spencer gave me a, a long interview about uh, their childhood and Diana's father gave permission to use some of her one perhaps and nobody's ever said this, but perhaps they were thinking this was a way out for Diana to actually ex express what's really been going on. It really did redefine the public's perception of the royal family. It laid bare uh, her bouts of bulimia, her alleged suicide attempts, her private misery. Uh, there were suggestions that Charles's friendship with Camilla Parker Bowles were perhaps more than just friendship. This would have sent shockwaves through the royal family because what this book was doing was opening up the family secrets. The fallout put Diana's sister Jane in an impossible position. I think Jane Fellow's loyalties were torn, but she, she had to side on the side of the monarchy because her husband was the Queen's private secretary. Prince Philip had a good relationship with Diana. Publication of her biography changed everything. Prince Philip would have been outraged that uh, Diana had chosen to pour out her soul in this way. This isn't the way things were done in the Windsor or the Mountbatten family come to that. But what he did during that summer and autumn of 1992, he wrote her a series of letters which were tough and unflinching in many regards, but they were also uh, full of compassion and understanding. He was saying to her, I too was an outsider who married into this family. I too had to make huge adjustments to my life uh, to accommodate this weird and wacky world of the Windsors. Um, but if I can do it, you can do it. Prince Philip's interventions were in vain. By November 1992, it was clear that the Spencer-Windsor union was over. The tour of South Korea was really the last hurrah, I suppose. It was a picture of unhappiness, of marital turmoil. On the 9th of December, 1992, the inevitable announcement was made by Prime Minister John Major. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Within days, the Spencer family took sides. As the marriage completely unraveled and the awful years that followed, they were immensely loyal to Diana. When Diana separated from uh, Prince Charles, she, she came to rely a lot more on her big sister, Sarah. Sarah becomes a sort of de facto lady in waiting and she trusts Sarah uh, to be at her right hand side when she's on 
official visits abroad. She feels very safe with Sarah. Charles Spencer was also quick to put family first. I think after the separation, Diana was unsure whether she should stay at the palace or should she move out or where could she go when her brother, uh, Charles, her younger brother, offered her a garden house, which was on the Althorpe estate. It would offer her a great deal of privacy uh, away from the cameras um, and a new start, really. And she was very excited about this. But the plan was stopped in its tracks. Lord Spencer came to the conclusion that having the whole razzmatazz that goes with Diana right on his doorstep was not going to be such a good idea. So he ended up saying no. Well, Diana, of course, was deeply let down. She was devastated. She couldn't believe her brother had said no to her. And for a while, uh, the, the relationship between Charles and Charles Spencer, that is, and Diana was, was in the deep freeze. This is a Spencer um, tendency. They would have explosive arguments with one another and not talk for a very long time and then get back together. And Diana fitted into this box absolutely. Charles Spencer's relationship with his sister was eventually repaired. But in 1995, he was contacted by BBC journalist Martin Bashir who said he wanted to share some concerns he had about Diana's safety. Martin Bashir approached Charles Spencer, saying he wanted to do an interview based on security breaches. He had this suggestion that Diana was being spied upon, so that was his in. He then managed to engineer a meeting with Diana via Charles Spencer. And, well, one thing led to another, and before we knew it, uh, she was giving this explosive panorama interview to him. The historic interview that eventually aired on the BBC was watched by 23 million people in Britain alone. Panorama was jaw-dropping from beginning to end. Um, every sentence that came out of Diana's mouth was uh, extraordinary. Do you think Mrs Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. I actually knew most of it because I'd had long conversations with Diana, but what I didn't know is that she was going to question whether Prince Charles was fit to be king, whether indeed um, he wanted the top job, as she called it, whether he was cut out for it. Um, that was the dagger through the heart as far as the palace was concerned. And because I know the character, I would think that the top job, as I call it, would bring enormous limitations to him. And I don't know whether he could adapt to that. Charles Spencer had unwittingly set the wheels in motion for his family's biggest betrayal of the Windsors yet. So even though Charles Spencer introduced Princess Diana to Martin Bashir, he didn't know what the eventual documentary contained. No one did. He sat down to watch it with his mother at Althorpe and I think was as, a, as agog and as aghast as everybody else was in the country by what Diana had to say. It's kind of common courtesy within the family to let the Queen know if you're going to give um, an interview. And for Diana to do that, it really was an atom bomb. She lobbed a bomb into the kind of royal family and just watched it kind of go off. One of the rare occasions when the Queen intervened because she does try to stay out of the private affairs of, uh, of her family, but this time she wrote to Charles and she wrote to Diana and she said, get a divorce. On the 28th of February, 1996, Diana agreed to a divorce. The 15-year relationship between the Spencers and the Windsors was all but over. She's said to be inside Kensington Palace, very sad and very pensive, according to friends. A royal divorce for the second in line to the throne. This is monumental. You know, this is the breaking up of a, the fairy tale marriage that they had delivered to the nation. In many ways, there was a sense of relief um, on, from the Windsors that the divorce had come about for Diana's siblings. There was a relief too, because they had sort of been drawn into the vortex of the, uh, the Diana-Charles saga for so many years. 
I think everyone was, was worried about her, how she was going to cope in this sort of post-divorce world. Um, you know, she'd been stripped of her royal title. What was she going to do? She had to find a new role for herself. And as the families began to slip apart, Diana embraced her freedom from the Windsors. No one could have predicted the tragedy that would force them back together. By the summer of 1997, both the Spencer and Windsor families faced the fallout of Diana's newfound freedom. The Spencers and the Windsors were horrified. There was Diana going out with an Egyptian playboy. She was off the rails as far as they were concerned at this time. Diana's own mother was absolutely furious. She wasn't, in fact, on speaking terms with her mother at all. But one person stepped forward to listen in the unlikely form of an old family foe, Johnny Spencer's widow, Rain. Diana was full of surprises throughout her life, and there were few surprises uh, to compete with her decision to change Rain Spencer from being the, the hated, wicked stepmother to becoming a close confidant. Rain was an outsider. Diana considered herself an outsider, and she found great comfort and consolation in Rain. Rain was appointed to one of Harrod's boards by Muhammad al fayed and um, that cemented, really, um, the connection between Diana's Spencer family, if you like, with Muhammad al fayed At the end of August 1997, Dodi Fayed took Diana to Paris. The events that followed pushed the already strained relationship between the Spencers and the Windsors to breaking point. The Mercedes in which the princess had been traveling with Dodie fired. The driver lost control. The car span overturned and hit a pillar. News leaked out slowly to the Spencer family, and it wasn't clear whether Diana was alive or dead. Diana's mother was sitting at home in Scotland, waiting. She gets one phone call, uh, Diana's been injured, doesn't get another word. It was a terrible ordeal for the whole family to go through. Just th this gradual seeping under the door of information. At 4 a.m., Diana was officially pronounced dead. The British ambassador phoned Balmoral to tell the royal family the news. As far as Prince Charles was concerned, when he heard the news at first, he was absolutely horrified and he said everybody was going to blame him. But more than that, feeling this was going to have a, a disastrous effect on the monarchy itself. Prince Charles had made a decision, against the Queen's wishes, to go to Paris with Diana's sisters, Sarah and Jane, to bring Diana home. Charles fought for Diana more strongly after her death than he had done in her life. It was a strange irony. Thrown together in grief, the Spensters and the Windsors had less than a week to make arrangements. There was quite a tussle uh, between the Spencers and the Windsors as to uh, what kind of funeral they wanted. Is she a member of the royal family? Is she a member of the Spencer clan? Is she royal? She's no longer HRH. She's divorced. I mean, who is she? There was a huge falling out, certainly, between Charles Spencer and the Prince of Wales, and they had a big verbal altercation on the telephone. So much so, the Prince of Wales ended up hanging the phone up on Charles Spencer. Charles Spencer was too Spencer-like, and Prince Charles was too Windsor-like, so they never connected. The planning for the funeral was extremely fraught, but it was largely kept in the hands of the palace. Diana's mother was very upset that she wasn't really involved in the funeral. She really did have very little say, which upset her enormously. The Spencers would have preferred a family funeral, but I've no doubt as soon as they saw the outpouring of grief, it became clear that something much grander and inclusive than a private funeral was needed. And it was the beginning of a week of mass hysteria, I think. 
we went collectively into hysterical mourning about the loss of, of the princess. There was a kind of paralyzing inactivity at the heart of the royal institution. Nobody really quite knew what to do or how to play it. And the queen fell back on protocol on tradition. People asked the mother of the nation to show that she was the mother of the nation, whereas her response was to be the grandmother to the boys and to stay in Balmoral. The public thought it was very unfeeling and they thought the queen should be down in London uh, mourning with everyone, but that's not the way the royal family have ever, ever done things. But of course, Diana's death changed everything. This is what people wanted and this is what people expected. I think it's disgusting that they have not appeared or said a word. I think it's a disgrace on the whole royal family. And there was a really sort of strong feeling in the capital, almost a feeling of revolution. The Queen bowed to public pressure and returned to London with William and Harry the day before the funeral. It would have been a massive shock for William and Harry to see that kind of massive public reaction, some would say overreaction. People who'd never met their mother crying and screaming and, and wailing. William, William. Thank you so much. You know, grin and grip, smile, thank you so much. That smile, thank you so much. It, it gives me the shivers, actually. It feels so inappropriate that those two boys were effectively kind of wheeled out to meet the general public. After one of the most astonishing weeks in British history, the funeral was a chance for both families to put their differences aside and grieve together. It was attended by a million mourners in London and billions more around the world. There was a sharp intake of breath at seeing these terribly young boys looking up at the carriage that carried their mother's coffin. Royal tradition is that the male members of the family do accompany the funeral cortege. Prince Harry told me, looking back, it was absolutely terrible that they would do this for a 12-year-old boy. This is, of course, a Windsor decision, not a Spencer one, to make him walk behind his mother's coffin. Oh, I get emotional. Um, and to have to share his grief with millions of people who were crying and thinking they knew her. She was my mother. They didn't know her. She was mine. And he said he had to clasp his hands and dig his fingers into his palm so that he didn't cry. The division between the Spencer and Windsor families was there for all to see. It fell to Charles Spencer to deliver the funeral address. I stand before you today the representative of a family in grief, in a country in mourning, before a world in shock. Earl Spencer's eulogy was one of the most astonishing speeches of the 20th century. On behalf of your mother and sisters, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men, so that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. It was devastating in its assault on the royal family in the sense that it was suggested that the boys uh, had been constricted by these old-fashioned fuddy-duddy traditions. I was reporting it sort of opposite the Abbey, and when we heard that eulogy, I thought, oh my God, goodness, he's actually damning the royal family. The eulogy was unconventional. It was rebellious. It was all the, all the words that you would come to associate with the Spencers. The Spencers do have a different way of dealing with pain and tragedy. The Windsors, they keep up a good front. It's a stiff upper lip. Um, whereas uh, the Spencers are much more inclined to 
crash about and uh, let it all come out. This was a terrific shock to the royal system. And I think the Queen must have been absolutely appalled by what he said, and worse still, by the response that he got. Just as he finished, there was a sort of noise in the abbey. It sounded almost like hailstones on the roof, but actually it was people clapping outside. And, it, and that sound swept into the abbey until the people at the front, the royal family, such as Prince Charles, Prince William and Harry, you know, they, they went along with it too and started applauding him too. The only people that didn't, that I could see clearly didn't, were the Queen and the Queen Mother. And the Queen is his godmother. That's how closely bound the, the Windsors and the Spencers are. And I think it was extremely courageous of the Earl to make his feelings so pointedly known. This was a rapier thrust from her own godson, and I think the Queen was, was quite shaken by it, actually. It was possibly the most audacious eulogy in front of the Queen for hundreds of years by a member of, of the aristocracy. Um, critical of the monarch to her face, critical of the royal family to their faces. It was an extraordinary kind of act of rebellion. After the scathing attack, as the Earl reclaimed both Diana and her son so publicly to the Spencer family, could the Spencer's relationship with the Windsors ever recover? The death of Diana was the death of the very long-term relationship between the Windsors and the Spencers. There was such bad feeling. The relationship between the two families was very much broken for a long time. After the funeral, Diana was taken back to the Spencer family estate at Althorpe to be buried. Charles Spencer, you know, said she's a Spencer, she's come back home. On the way to Althorpe, the Queen's private secretary offered to reinstate Diana's HRH title in an attempt to reconcile their differences. Sir Robert Fellows did offer to uh, reinstate that title, Her Royal Highness, for Diana, but Charles Spencer refused that offer. The Windsor flag had been draped over Diana's coffin. In a symbolic gesture, it was replaced by the Spencer family flag. The Spencer flag was put in its place, and that was very, very significant. It's like, Diana is ours now. She is returned to her family. It was a very, very pointed and significant moment. It meant for the Spencer family that they had reclaimed Diana. <laughs> The Spencer and the Windsor families will always be linked by William and Harry. The Spencers have been more closely involved with Harry and William than, than we know about. They do it quietly behind the scenes. There is a very close relationship between uh, the boys and their aunts and uncle. Sarah. Spencer was incredibly kind that very soon after Diana's death, she took to Eton the toy that Diana had brought while she was in Paris for Harry's birthday, and she wanted him to receive that, and that was a very kind aunt thing to do. Diana's sisters have tried to be there for William and Harry at their major milestones. In 2010, Prince Harry received his pilot wings from the Army Air Corps and Sarah and Jane were on hand to witness that. There's been a big Spencer turnout at both William and Kate's wedding and Harry and Meghan's wedding. Harry and William are very much aware that the Spencers are there for them. In 2004, the Diana Memorial Fountain was unveiled in Hyde Park. The Spencers and the Windsors were there en masse for the first time since Diana's funeral. 
The event was a chance for the two families to rebuild their troubled relationship. Of course, there were difficult times, but memories mellow with the passing of the years. It was a sort of truce between the two families that let's move on, we will try to repair the damage as much as we can. At the event, Charles Spencer publicly played down the rift between the two families. I think the whole anger or rift or whatever has been really overplayed in the media and um, it hasn't been like that for us. But you know emotions were running very, very high everywhere in those days after Diana's death and at her funeral. And I think in the years that have gone by, um, things have calmed down a, a, a great deal. But it would be a further three years before Prince Harry stepped forward in a show of public solidarity as a Spencer. At the memorial service for 10 years after Diana died, Harry actually crossed the nave of the church and went and sat with the Spencers for the service. And some interpreted that as a very public statement that he was more Spencer than Windsor. Harry particularly has wanted to show that he is very much in tune and in contact with the Spencer side of his family. Harry obviously looks like a Spencer more than a Windsor. Diana's nickname for Harry in the early days was My Little Spencer. And that's because he had the freckles, he had the uh, red hair that is very characteristic of the Spencer family. And if you look at pictures of Sarah McCorkadale, Diana's big sister, she's the spitting image of Prince Harry, or rather he's the spitting image of her. He's a true Spencer as well. He's reckless, something of a rebel. That rebellious Spencer spirit lives on in the royal family through the princes. The relationship between the Windsors and the Spencers has been strained over the years, but both families are now invested together in the British monarchy. Both families have put the past behind them. They did have to bury the hatchet because William is the future king. He is part Spencer and part Windsor. By proxy, Diana is injected into the, the royal institution when William becomes king. For the Spencers, their, 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 their blood will, he will be in, is in the future King of England. I mean, he is, he is half Spencer, William. Their place in history is assured because of the children that Diana had. The Spencers and the Windsors have been, at times, the clash of the titans. They've, they've been two families who, with a deep relationship and without the Spencers, the Windsors wouldn't be the family they are today. <laughs>